uh, my doctoral dissertation focused to a great extent on the, the theology of Maximus the Confessor, who is a seventh century Greek author. But thanks to my encounter with Frank and also with John Makransky, who is still uh, very well respected and loved a member of the faculty at BC, you know, I uh, sort of broadened my horizons and became very interested in, you know, the whole issue of comparative theology, you see. And so I ended up writing a dissertation on Maximus the Confessor in conversation with Tsongkhapa, who is the figure that we will also mention later on uh, tonight. And so I started the sort of um, personal and intellectual trajectory in the study of Tibetan Buddhism that I have continued until, until the present. Um, you know, the academic uh, kind of landscape today, you know, in 2021 is actually quite different from um, what it was even 20 years ago, because 20 years ago, there were not uh, quite as many programs in comparative theology as today. Uh, you have to remember that, um, you know, even at Boston College, for instance, comparative theology would be uh, carried out under the aegis of systematic theology. They didn't actually have a distinctive program in, uh, in comparative theology. And this is actually what I did. Nowadays, instead, you know, the study of comparative theology has become, you know, a really important subdiscipline, you know, within, you know, the broader, you know, academic uh, landscape. Georgetown has its own program, etc. You know, uh, so um, in my study of, uh, uh, you know, Buddhist Christian dialogue, I was very interested in really uh, the interface between speculative reflection and uh, spiritual practice. You see, I was not really interested in uh, uh, a pure exploration of their own abstract speculative systems. I was really interested in the way in which uh, their speculative understanding informed uh, their own understanding of spiritual practice and spiritual commitment. And this is actually one of the reasons why I'm very glad to be at the uh, Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara and also at the Graduate Theological Union because uh, you know both the Jesuit School of Theology and the Graduate Theological Union are you know academic venues where uh, you know you are, if you are a scholar practitioner, you're actually welcome to do so. You can actually be someone who is intellectually interested in the exploration of a certain tradition, but you're also, but also someone who is also interested in the practice of this tradition. And I know this is not always the case everywhere, you know. And so I have continued over the years to kind of uh, explore, study, you know, the way in which, uh, you know, the early Christian tradition and Tibetan Buddhism uh, address certain specific questions about individual spiritual transformation. You see, um, I've also been uh, interested in the history of Buddhist Christian dialogue over the years, and um, I uh, became very intrigued uh, by the figure of Hippolyto Desideri, um, who is a Jesuit who lived between the late 17th in the early 18th century, the exact data are 1684 to 1733. And uh, Desideri was really the first Westerner, not just, re not just the first Jesuit, but really the first Westerner who visited Tibet and actually came to master the Tibetan language and entered into a sustained philosophical and even really existential conversation uh, with Tibetan Buddhists, you see. You know, there is a whole kind of industry out there of um, so-called Jesuitica, you know, let's explore the, you know, the Jesuit missions to Asia in the 16th and the 17th century. But the emphasis has always been China and Japan. I'm sure many of you know, you know, people, uh, there's a lot of literature out there about Matteo Ricci, you know, who, uh, you know, went to, uh, was the first uh, European to enter the Forbidden City and uh, wrote his treatises in Chinese. And even today you can go and visit his, uh, tomb in the garden of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, palace which belongs to the Chinese Communist Party, but they let you go in and visit, you know, and also people all know about uh, Francis Xavier and Balignano and all the adventures of the Jesuits in Japan, but for some reason, uh, Hippolyte Desideri is not as well known as these other figures, you see, so I became very intrigued with his figure and his legacy, and um, right at a time when, in fact, the English speaking world was actually discovering uh, the, the world of Desideri. Now, uh, let me show you 
uh, let me share my screen with you and show you something and I hope I'm going to be successful in my endeavor. What can you see? You can probably see this flyer. Let me actually show you a map. Uh, now, uh, Desideri um, was a native of Pistoia in uh, the region of Tuscany. It's a city which is not very far from Florence. And uh, like most, if not all, Italian Jesuits of his time, he was educated at the Roman college. And then he petitioned uh, the general to uh, be sent to the Asian missions. So in um, 1714, he was allowed to leave. And uh, like, again, all other uh, Jesuits who were traveling to Asia at the time, uh, left for the Portuguese colony of Goa, which was really the entry point into Asia at the time. And then he traveled towards the north and eventually uh, settled in Agra for a brief period of time. Agra was the center of the Jesuit missions in, the, in Northern India at the time. Even if you go today, you will actually see many traces of uh, the presence of the Jesuits in, in that region. And then uh, with one companion, he, uh, set out on you know, his journey towards Tibet. Uh, and you see, he went on a very roundabout journey uh, through uh, Lahore, which is in today's Pakistan, uh, to the region of Kashmir, to Ladakh. Uh, you see Leh here, which is the capital of Ladakh, which he calls Outer Tibet. And he spent quite some time there. Uh, and initially he was actually thinking about staying there, but uh, then he decided to do otherwise. And he joined a um, um, caravan that was uh, traveling to Lhasa and eventually uh, reached Lhasa in early 1716. And he was able to remain in the Lhasa region, traveling to other locations in Tibet for a period of about four years which were a very momentous period in the history of Tibet. So I'm going to say a bit more about that in a, in a moment. Um, interestingly enough, when he reached Lhasa, he discovered that, uh, well, he actually did already know that, but you know, he uh, you know, discovered that there were some Franciscans who were already based there. Uh, but the Franciscans were actually um, essentially serving as uh, medical doctors uh, and they only really interacted with the local Tibetan population through interpreters from India, you see. So they spoke Hindi to the interpreters who translated them to, into Tibetan, you know, and with the locals. But they didn't have any actual direct interaction with the locals and they didn't actually speak the language. Now, the Sideri remained there alone because his companion left him and stayed there for quite a while. And um, he uh, realized that uh, if he wanted to learn something about their, the culture of the people of this place, he really had to master his own language and their, their own their language and their philosophical system. And so he spent some time at a number of um, um, uh, monastic institutions in the region. I'm going to show you a few pictures uh, later on. And then in 1720, he had to leave the country, largely because uh, Propaganda Fide uh, decided that uh, the mission to Tibet actually belonged to the Franciscans, you see, and not to the Jesuits, you know. So interestingly enough, he spent a lot of his time while he was in Lhasa, actually uh, in correspondence with his different Vatican authorities, uh, trying to convince them to actually give the mission of, of Tibet to the Society of Jesus as opposed to the Franciscans. But eventually the Vatican decided otherwise because the Franciscans had arrived there before. So he was told to leave. And as a very obedient Jesuit, he actually did do so and uh, returned to India, this time traveling by way of Nepal. You see, so you can see here, Katman, he went over to Katmandu, which is very close to the Bhutanese border, um, Kathmandu, and then all the way down to Patna. And actually, he then went to the south of India for quite some time and uh, uh, before returning to Italy. And he spent the rest of his life trying to get back to Tibet. He never actually managed to do so. Um, but uh, what he did is that he wrote a sort of autobiographical um, overview of uh, his experiences um, 
in, uh, in Tibet, known as the relazione or relation, you see, which is uh, um, really a masterful work uh, which blends autobiography, historiography, uh, theology, ethnography, uh, linguistics, uh, geography, you know, it's a very interdisciplinary text. And uh, this work was inaccessible for the longest of time because it was not published uh, during this there is lifetime. In fact, he was ordered no, not to publish any of his material because, again, he was not entitled to work in, in the Tibetan mission. You know, he died in Rome without ever being able to return, uh, you know, to Tibet. Later on, uh, some Italian ethnographers who were not uh, Jesuits or missionaries in any sense actually rediscovered his text and published it in the 19th century. And uh, in 1956, Luciano Petek, who was uh, a very important and influential Italian scholar of uh, Tibet and the Himalayas, published it in this uh, series called Il Nuovo Ramusio, you know, uh, which is an anthology of writings by Italian missionaries in Tibet and in Nepal, you see, 1956. Now, this text is extremely difficult to find, even today, because it's out of print. And um, I was trying to find it for a few years, and I was not very successful. I was trying to get it in, through interlibrary loan. And then uh, I can descend into the anecdotal and tell you that in 2012, I went to a used bookstore in Venice and found the whole series there on the bookshelf in front of me. Uh, after having, and completely by accident, you know, I mean, I know that this sounds like a made up story, but it's true. So I bought it and I brought it with me here and it had never been read. I had to cut all the pages, you know, with a knife, you know, which is interesting because I was doing that on BART uh, in, you know, on our metro system when everybody is either on their phone or on their iPad and I'm reading a book with a knife, you see, cutting off the pages. It's very interesting. But, however, around, around the same time, there were some American scholars who were also rediscovering Desideri. And you are probably familiar with his book by Trent Pomplon, who is now at the University of Notre Dame, who wrote his book, Jesuit on the Roof of the World, which contains long excerpts of Desideri's uh, text translated into English, although not, not the whole thing at all, you know, and with some reflections. Then later, more recently, Michael Sweet, uh, with the help of Leonard Zwilling, actually published a translation of the whole text of the mission to Tibet. And this book was published, I believe, in 2012. So for the first time, English speakers can actually access this text, which really until now was only really um, uh, accessible to you know, Italian speakers or readers of highly complex and elaborate Baroque Italian prose, because even for Italian speakers, it's not actually all that easy to read. You know? And I am uh, full of admiration for the translators because <laughs> I cannot imagine actually setting down to translate this text. I will confess to you, I have not read this translation because I only read the original one, uh, but I did read the introduction and you know, they provide a lot of interesting uh, support material. You see. Now, the Zideri, uh, the result is that, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, there has been an explosion of interest in the English speaking world uh, on the Zideri studies. And in 2017, you, know, you can see it, the city of Pistoia in Tuscany, which is the city where the Zideri was born, organized an international conference on, uh, you see here, the human, religious, and scientific value of the great enterprise of the Pistoiese missionary three centuries later. Uh, the conference was supposed to take place in 2016 to mark the 300th anniversary of uh, Desideri's arrival. In Laza, it was postponed by a year because in 2017, the city of Pistoia was the EU capital of culture. They got more funding. And so the conference was held one year later. And I actually was one of the Helper, I mean, one of the people who helped organize this event uh, with some of the locals uh, in Pistoia and um, the journal Buddhist Christian uh, Studies, which uh, I co edited, actually published all the uh, proceedings of this conference, um, you know, in uh, 2018. Now, um, let me show you 
a few pictures of some of the locations that uh, Desideri actually visited. And then we are going to move on and uh, talk a bit about his own thought. Let's see. These are some pictures that I took myself in 2015 during my visit where well, everybody recognizes the Potala in Glaza, uh, uh, where, um, um, you know, of course, uh, the Dalai Lamas already lived, you know, around the time of uh, Desideri's visit. It is very interesting to read this of the Relazione uh, uh, to notice that uh, the Dalai Lama is hardly mentioned in Desideri's writings. Uh, and he was much more involved in um, all sorts of dealings uh, with, uh, you know, the civil authorities uh, that uh, were actually ruling, you know, the country at the time. Um, although, you know, the, you know, the Dalai Lamas were nominally the, the rulers of the country since 1642, you know, since, uh, you know, the time of the fifth Dalai Lama. Now, uh, you can see here, you know, an inscription of uh, the Chen Rizik, uh, uh, mantra Om Mani Padme Om on the walls of the Potala. This is an internal courtyard of the Potala. But here we have something which is more relevant to our conversation. Uh, this is the entry of the monastery of Serra, uh, which is uh, really just outside Laza. Uh, you know, even today, you know, it's, you know, in fact, some say, well, it's in Laza itself, which is um, a monastery which is associated with the uh, Gelug order. Uh, many of you will probably know that, uh, you know, there are, mm, there is a number of uh, different schools of Tibetan Buddhism and uh, the Gelug school of Tibetan Buddhism was, has been the dominant school from the mid 17th century really until the present because the Dalai Lama is a member of the Gelug school. Um, the monastery of Serra is one of the great monastic universities of Tibet and is associated with the Gelug tradition and even today continues to be a center of uh, uh, study for trainees, novices in the, in the Gaelic tradition. And, and this year he spent about six months there. And uh, he uh, discovered something very interesting. He discovered that monks participate in debates. And you can see here uh, a picture of some monks in the courtyards in, in Serra participating in debates. You know, you can't see it very well, but you know, this monk here, he's holding his hands like that because monks just, uh, you know, enunciate an argument, clap their hands and then wait for a response and they can go on and on and on like that. And these are very carefully staged choreographed uh, events, um, very much in the analogous to the tradition of the questiones disputate. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Desideri was also familiar with from his training at the Collegio Romano. You know, so here we have another image of the same uh, monastery in Serra. Um, now, there are uh, three great Gelug monastic universities. Um, one is uh, Serra. One is Drepung, which I did not visit, so I don't have any pictures from Drepung, even if uh, Drepung is technically the monastery of the Dalai Lama, although he, does, even, even before 1958, he didn't reside there, but technically he was associated with the monastery uh, in Drepung. The third one is the monastery of Ganden, uh, which is uh, about 40 miles, perhaps, from the city of Laza, and is uh, at, 4,300 meters in altitude, uh, uh, if I'm correct, I think this is about 14,000 feet, right? Something like that, very, very high. And um, Ganden, um, in fact, means joyful, I believe, you know, and it's, it's the word that is used to indicate a Tushita heaven in the, uh, in the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And this was the, the one uh, monastery out of the three great monastic universities uh, uh, associated with the Gelo tradition uh, that uh, was most closely associated with the figure of Tsongkhapa. Uh, and here I have to say something, I've introduced the figure of Tsongkhapa. Now Tsongkhapa really is the Thomas Aquinas of, of Tibetan Buddhism. You know, I mean, I, I, I really don't think this is an exaggeration because uh, his um, um, work so on uh, uh, 
Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist exegesis, uh, you know, from the earlier 15th century, have been regarded as, as normative within the Gaelic tradition and really within the broader tradition of Tibetan Buddhism ever since at least the 16th century because you know again after the Gelug ascendancy of the mid 17th century uh, sorry I think I misspoke and said the 16th I meant the 17th century you know since the mid 17th century you know with the ascendancy the political ascendancy of the Gelug order uh, essentially the philosophy of the Gelug tradition uh, became a sort of state philosophy uh, of Tibet as a whole and Tsongkhapa is the main sort of um, uh, the person who really articulates the philosophy of, of Gelug in, in his own writings. And so Ganden is the place where he actually completed his great treatise. Say I visited on a day where there is a lot of fog. Here you are. Um, this is me <laughs> in front of one of the usual, uh, uh, you know, wheels that decorate the entrance of the temples. Uh, and uh, so Desideri, encounter the figure of Tsongkhapa um, in, uh, in Ganden. And through Tsongkhapa, he encountered the whole uh, Majamaka philosophical tradition. Why is that? Because you see, very much like Aquinas, who quotes a lot of authorities, uh, you know, to support his arguments, uh, Tsongkhapa actually quotes a lot of uh, earlier authors, both from the Tibetan tradition and from the earlier Indian tradition of Mahayana, to actually support his own vision uh, of, uh, of Tibetan Buddhism. And from the relazione that uh, Desideri writes, we actually know that uh, um, Desideri translated the whole of uh, Tsongkhapa's great treatise into Italian. Um, because he was thinking about uh, actually writing a sort of um, extended commentary to, to this text, a sort of apologetic response to Tsongkhapa's great treatise. Uh, the problem is that uh, this translation was, has been lost. And uh, since uh, Desideri had to leave in 1720, he was never actually able to carry this out, you know. A third place that he visited, let me just mention this briefly before we actually move back maybe to Desideri's own uh, you know, philosophical sort of argumentation is the monastery of Samye. And probably David has been there, I'm sure. You know, the Samye is uh, uh, perhaps the oldest monastery in Tibet, I think, because the, the legend says that it was established during the, king, the reign of the second of the three Dharma kings in the mid eighth century. King Trisong, De Trisong Denzen, and both Padmasambhava, uh, great tantric master who bought, uh, brought uh, Buddhism to Tibet, and the monk Shantarakshita were involved in the uh, foundation of uh, uh, Samye, and Samye also saw the first great so-called council of Tibetan Buddhism, where essentially, you know, representatives of Chinese Buddhism and representatives of Indian Buddhism debated on which was the best interpretation of the Dharma. And according to Chinese sources, the Chinese representatives won. And according to Tibetan sources, the Indian representatives won. It's very interesting. Um, it's historically, perhaps we can say that yes, in the end, uh, especially at that time, uh, Tibetan Buddhism was more oriented towards the Indian interpretation of the Dharma. but this controversy indicates the extent to which Tibetan Buddhism has always been poised, you know, between, you know, these two great countries, these two great powers, these two great visions of the, and understandings of the Buddhist tradition. And, you know, in a way, this kind of uneasy balance continues to the present. Anyway, this is Samye from the outside. Um, and this is actually a hut, which according to legend belonged to Padmasambhava. So I hiked all the way there, you can see the valley of Samye underneath, which is one of the lower places in Tibet. So there is actually some agriculture and sees myself. Stop sharing pictures. Uh, and see, now, uh, what did Desideri actually really do? You know, uh, he was um, um, very much grounded in the Aristotelian tradition uh, of uh, um, you know, counter-reformation manualist Thomism. You know, that's quite a lot of words. 
by which I mean that people were not really in the early 18th century at the Collegio Romano. I don't want to overstate my case. And there have been, there are people out there who have tried to write articles on which books did Desideri actually really study when he was in Rome before coming to Tibet. And I think that's very conjectural to a great extent. We know that he did study geometry and mathematics because that was part of the broader Jesuit curriculum. Uh, but it's all virtually certain that he was exposed to great, great uh, excerpts from, you know, the Summa. And maybe he didn't read it just the Summa, but he read some of the manuals that people were actually reading at the time that sort of summarized and systematized and made Aquinas' thought more accessible. Uh, so one of the sort of foundational sort of features of uh, uh, you know, this kind of education was a very strong reliance on Aristotelian philosophy and on Aristotle's reflection on causality. And uh, as I'm sure many of you here know, you know, Aquinas develops his own proofs uh, for the existence of God, very much drawing on the tradition of Aristotelian causality. You know, there is this whole taxonomy of causes in the Aristotelian tradition. And the Aristotelian notion of first cause becomes the springboard for Aquinas' proof of the existence of God. And clearly, you know, Aquinas says, uh, if you follow reason, alone, independently of revelation, you will come to the conclusion that God exists, because God is the first cause. So, you know, Desideri arrives in Tibet in 1716, very much shaped by this uh, particular vision of rationality, which is really uh, Aristotelian rationality. And during his stays uh, at these different monastic universities, he encounters a completely different philosophical vision. You see. And you know, I wrote an article in for the Desideri Conference in 2017, which I mentioned earlier on, which is published in the Buddhist Christian Studies in 2018. So if you wish, you can go read it there. I'm not going to read it from it now, but I'm just trying to summarize the main points. Uh, when Desideri arrives at these monastic universities, he encounters a completely different way of thinking. Uh, he encounters the Majamaka tradition of philosophy, which uh, really was the backbone of uh, you know, the Gelug uh, monastic curriculum. And uh, the Majamaka, you know, I'm sure David can correct me, but I'm trying to give a very simple sort of overview of this um, you know, tradition. The Majamaka tradition you know, drives the distinction between conventional reality and ultimate reality. Tsongkhapa essentially spends most of his especially the second volume of the great treatise, debating the relationship between conventional reality and ultimate reality. And he then questions, you know, the way in which causality can be understood. Well, he explores the way in which causality can be understood in different ways and starts saying, well, on one hand, at the ultimate reality, we have to let go entirely of the notion of cause and effect. On the other hand, at the level of conventional reality, we cannot let go of the notion of cause and effect because we function within a web of causality that actually sustains conventional reality as a whole. And uh, it's very important to essentially uh, notice that we are talking about two different perspectives on the same reality. We are not talking about two distinct realities. Sometimes, you know, all the literature on Buddhism seems to talk about conventional reality as, you know, this ordinary world and ultimate reality as another reality, like the world of the ideas in Plato. But that's not the case at all. We are talking about different perspectives. And we need conventional reality because without conventional reality, how can you practice? You know, we uh, can engage in compassionate acts on behalf of other sentient beings because we all dwell in a world where there are regularities that we can predict. And this shows quite clearly that the practice of Tibetan Buddhism is not at all uh, a form of nihilism because uh, Tibetan Buddhism does not teach that there is nothing out there. No, that's completely wrong. What we have is a phenomenal flux uh, onto which we superimpose our own labels uh, so that we then read uh, this conventional reality as a set of independent substances that are linked by a web of causes and effects. But in reality, there are no such distinct substances. All that exists out there is this phenomenal flux. You know, our hermeneutic sort of perspective superimposes this kind of set of categories on reality. But, you know, we just have a set of phenomena. Uh, 
this approach is radically distinct and in a way radically challenges you know the, the Aristotelian understanding of causality that ultimately postulates a first cause. And uh, because it essentially affirms very strongly that reality as a whole is a phenomenal flux characterized by a, a so-called codependent origination. Uh, the, the Tibetan term is tendrel. Some people are often more familiar with the uh, Sanskrit term pratitya samutpada, which really you know, is translated as things falling together because of a cause that came before. Uh, so yes, codependent origination. Um, and the Majavaka tradition says that if you follow reason correctly, you are going to come to espouse the belief in codependent origination. So see, Desideri was told that if you follow reason correctly, you are going to come to an understanding of the existence of the first cause, which of course is identical with the Judeo-Christian God of the Christian scriptures. And then he comes to Tibet and he encounters a completely different mode of rationality that uh, affirms instead that if you use reason correctly, you're going to have to deny the existence of any first cause and instead affirm the, uh, the presence of this whole uh, kind of uncaused chain of being uh, that has no beginning and no end. And see, obviously, this uh, kind of provoked Desideri, and uh, you know, he set out to write a number of uh, treatises in the Tibetan language, uh, where he addressed some of the aspects of these teachings, such as you know, the notion of codependent origination. And he claimed that the notion of codependent origination essentially was flawed. Uh, but could actually become the springboard for uh, a kind of philosophical trajectory that would inevitably culminate in the assertion of the existence of a first cause. So let me actually share a quote, the only one that I'm going to show you tonight. I hope you can see it. You see, this is from the text, uh, Dun Kun, the origin of all living beings and all things. And I'm just going to read it. If one acknowledges and accepts that there is a self-existent being, the doctrine of codependent origination makes total sense. But if one does not, such doctrine cannot be explained. Because it is only by accepting the existence of such a being that we can explain how effects are produced by causes. Conversely, by denying that such a being exists, we can no longer justify that effects are produced by their causes, for these can only be accounted for by positing an uncaused cause at the beginning of it all. This is what Desideri says. Now, of course, his interlocutors would not have agreed with the claims of this kind, because uh, he says that in order to affirm codependent origination, you need to affirm the existence of a self-existent being. So he's going some way towards his adversary saying, well, you can actually affirm the teaching of codependent origination, which is part of your own tradition. You can do that. But in order to affirm your own tradition, you need to add something else which your, your own tradition is not actually telling you. And this is what I'm going to teach you. See, So he's sort of building on their own tradition. He's not trying to debunk the notion of codependent origination from the beginning. He's not starting off by saying, you know, I'm coming here to teach you that your understanding of causality is inherently incorrect and uh, therefore it needs to be replaced by a completely alternative approach to causality. He is actually trying to sort of embrace what is already present in the tradition uh, and build on it by adding certain correctives, let's say, that come from a different source, which is you know, the presence of an uncaused cause or a self-existent being. And indeed, he actually says that if you deny that such a being exists, if you denying that the first cause exists, you Tibetans will no longer even be able to say that effects are produced by their causes, which ultimately Tsongkhapa says is the case, you know, in, in Majamaka, because Desideri says, you can only talk about a regularity between causes and effects by positing an uncaused cause. Note that, and, uh, 
I could sort of go on forever here, but you know, one uh, way in which the Tibetans used to proceed, you know, especially in the Prasangika tradition of Majamaka, was to show that, uh, you know, the arguments of their adversary made no sense because uh, uh, if uh, you believe X, then uh, that has all sorts of absurd consequences. Therefore, you cannot believe X. Therefore, if you are in a debate with someone, you're going to show your opponent that, you know, your your beliefs have all sorts of absurd implications. And interestingly enough, this is what, what this is actually kind of doing here. You know, he's showing, oh, you see, if you actually believe what you believe, say you believe, what you say you believe has all sorts of absurd implications, therefore you cannot believe it. So he's kind of like imitating the Majamaka Prasangika way of thinking to debunk the Majamaka Prasangika argument, you know. So he postulates the existence of a first cause as a way to actually strengthen the, the teaching of codependent origination. Now, this is a complicated argument and that we could go on in great detail and say more about that. But let me just say this. Why is Desideri doing that? Because he is, if you want to apply a sort of contemporary category to what Desideri is doing, you could say that he's operating from a so-called partial fulfillment uh, sort of model of uh, religious pluralism. You know, some of you may be familiar with the work of Paul Nitter, who is, um, uh, well, he used to teach at Xavier University in Cincinnati and has written extensively about uh, different models of theologies of religion. And uh, one of the models of theology of religions that uh, Nitter outlines is um, partial fulfillment, which says that, uh, well, you know, there are elements of other religious traditions that actually are already true, but they need to be corrected and uh, sort of supplemented by elements that come from Christianity. Uh, so, in a sense, you know, Matteo Ricci was doing that already when he was, uh, uh, you know, trying to argue that uh, the Christian notion of God essentially integrates certain components that are already present in the notion of the Lord of Heaven in the Chinese tradition. So, this there is saying, look, there are seeds of the world, elements of truth already in the Tibetan tradition, uh, but they need to be corrected, they need to be integrated with elements that I'm going to bring here. Now, of course, the question we could ask today is, um, did his method actually really work? Is, it, is his method something that we should all follow? And I tend to be perhaps uh, less um, epistemologically assertive uh, than he was, because um, I think one of the problems uh, of a lot of um, sort of Christian theological epistemology is its presumption that uh, Aristotelian rationality is and ought to be normative for all people in all places, you know, and a lot of Christian philosophy has kind of operated in this mode for the longest of time, you know, so Aristotelian rationality is essentially a reflection of the way things are. Alternative modes of rationality are somehow defective or need supplementation or correction. Is this really a way we should proceed, you know? And in, in my article, I, I talked about, uh, um, Another scholar, Garfields, who is um, actually reinterpreted Majamaka, saying that perhaps uh, what we should really know, do is to kind of re -pre modify our presentation of codependent origination by saying that really uh, this model entails the sufficiency of this pattern of regularities, uh, and that uh, really we don't need to supplement uh, this pattern of regularities with an external cause because the pattern of regularity that Majamaka actually hones in is sufficient to explain reality as such, you see. And so this kind of cuts, you know, underneath, uh, you know, this there is argument completely. Uh, but he was never really confronted with this kind of response, you see. So, so what I'm saying is that, you know, he operates according to a particular theological epistemology, which is very interesting. It can be very fruitful, but perhaps nowadays we don't necessarily have to espouse his own theological epistemology, and we may want to proceed from a different perspective. Now, I see that it's past 6.45. Uh, the, the last thing that I wanted to say is, well, uh, maybe uh, being a overly ambitious person, I decided uh, a couple of years ago to uh, myself sit down and actually try and write uh, a commentary to Tsongkhapa's treatise. Uh, the, you know, some of you may know uh, of, uh, you know, may be familiar with the work of Catherine Cornell, who is a professor at Boston College. She started off this series 
uh, on um, Christian commentaries to non-Christian texts. She started off with the commentary of the Bhagavad Gita. And there are quite a lot there. Uh, recently, Perry Schmidt Leukel published a very extensive, you know, 650 pages long commentary to the Bodhicharya Avatara by Shantideva. So now I started to write um, a commentary to Tsongkhapa's uh, uh, treatise. Uh, and I almost feel, well, you know, Desideri was never able to actually do his own apologetic uh, uh, kind of response to Tsongkhapa. Uh, when we 300 years later, I'm going to try and do a Christian commentary to Tsongkhapa, which nobody really has ever done, you know. I once met uh, Robert Thurman, you know, uh, many of you will know that, who is a very important scholar of um, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and he told me, oh, I am sure that Desideri actually did write his commentary, and it must be locked in the Vatican somewhere. I thought, oh, you know that? Uh, I wouldn't be so sure. Uh, I don't think he knows, Robert Thurman knows very much about what goes on at the Vatican, you know. Uh, so I tend to think that probably whatever Desideri wrote on Tsongkhapa was largely lost, and we are never really going to find it again, you know, except for, you know, some of them, you know, references to Tsongkhapa's work in these full short Tibetan treatises, you know. But, uh, you know, so I, I hope to be able, but I, 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 I kind of, I could say in a perhaps overly grandiose way that I feel inspired by what he did. And I feel like I'm trying to sort of continue a kind of conversation that he wasn't really able to, to kind of bring to conclusion. And interest, I, I think paradoxically, you know, although my command of the language is certainly not as good as his was, that it's easier today to do that than it was 300 years ago, because the materials that we have at our disposal are immense. You know, now we can go to a library and actually find all the texts by Chandrakirti and Nagarjuna that Tsongkhapa is quoting. And probably this area was not able to have access to all those texts in the same way. So it's actually much easier to actually do this kind of work today than it was 300 years ago. So I think I'm going to end here and then let David speak for a moment. But thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas, for that great uh, lecture. There's a lot to unpack there, and uh, I'm sure um, you and David can continue to do that in, in conversation with um, audience questions included. So um, let me take a moment to introduce <clears throat> your con the conversation partner for today, David Gray. Um, and, and just a reminder again, if you have questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A chat down below. Um, David Gray is the Bernard J. Hanley Professor of Religious Studies at Santa Clara University, where he teaches a wide range of Asian religious courses Asian religion courses, sorry. His research explores the development of tantric Buddhist traditions in South Asia and their dissemination in Tibet and East Asia, with a focus on the Yogin Tantras, a genre of Buddhist tantric literature that focused on female deities and yogic practices involving the subtle body. His publications include numerous journal articles and book chapters, an edited volume, as well as the Chakra Samvara Tantra, a study and annotated translation um, from 2007, the Chakra Samvara Tantra editions of the Sanskrit and Tibetan text translations from 2012, Illumination of the Hidden Meaning, Mandala Mantra and the Cult of Yoginis um, from 2017, and Illumination of the Hidden Meaning Part Two, uh, Yogic Vows, Conduct and Ritual Practice from 2019. So thank you, Dave, for being here as, as part of this event and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Thomas, for your very interesting uh, presentation. I don't have any corrections to make. I think you made a really nice summary, for example, of Madhyamaka thought. I had some questions for you, uh, or at least first a quick comment. Uh, the last two books I worked on that Aaron mentioned were translations of one of Tsongkhapa's works, which is massive, you know, two oh. huge thick volumes and the great treatise is a huge work. So I imagine you have a very uh, large undertaking writing your, oh, yes. your Christian I am, commentary. I am, I am moving to get a copy here, although this is, you know, um, this is actually the, um, you know, the Lumbrian Chelmo Translation Committee actually published this uh, uh, translation, you know, in, in, the, in the year 2000, you know, so here is one of the three, this is volume one, you know, so many, maybe some people here are actually familiar with with these yeah. things, you know, and I, I've been reading a lot of literature. And I'm actually, I, one thing that I did not say is that I'm actually trying to write this from the sort of, philo from an Eastern Christian perspective, actually, in particular, because uh, um, 
I've been trying to develop this kind of conversation between the Tibetan tradition and the tradition of the Philokalia, you know, which is, uh, I don't know how much you know about that, you know, but uh, the Philokalia is this anthology of uh, Eastern Christian monastic spiritual writings that was published in the early, well, late 18th century, although it comprises uh, writings from the 4th to the 14th century. And, and there are uh, texts that deal with, uh, you know, really ascetic practice and Christian meditation, so to speak. And there are a lot of parallelisms between these two traditions. And nobody really brings them into conversation ever or hardly. You know, they seem to, ex you know, scholarship on these two things seem to exist in, you know, in separate universes. And I thought it would be interesting to bring the two of them together. But I started to talk again and I prevent you from asking questions. Oh, oh no, no problem whatsoever. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned, you, you showed us the Lamrim Chemo translation you know, the translation of Tsongkhapa's great stages on the path, his great treatise. And as you mentioned in your presentation, you know, we scholars working today have a lot more, a lot more resources at our disposal. For example, you have a great sound English translation, you know, to work from. Well, of course, Desideri wouldn't have had that. He had to learn Tibetan. Very, very impressive thing he did there. And, you know, it's clear to me, I don't know very much about Desideri, but it's clear to me he must have had a lot of, you know, interaction with the monks at places like, you know, Gandan and Sera, learned about, learned their language and also their religious culture, to some degree, their philosophy. And I think it was great how you pointed out that he was trying to imitate the Madhyamaka style of reasoning, you know, pointing out the kind of flaws in your opponent's argument. Yeah, prasangika, yeah, but yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Now, but on the other hand, you know, what I don't know, and maybe you know something about this, is I don't know what was the response of the monks he was working with. Maybe this is unknowable, you know, we don't have that information, but, you know, his argument that you, you know, outlined for us in the quote, the idea that causality doesn't work unless you have this idea of a first cause, which of course implies God, at least in the, the Christian interpretation of, of, of Aristotelian thought. On the other hand, Buddhists, for Buddhists, that argument would not have been unfamiliar. They had Buddhists in India had been debating for centuries with Hindu theologians who used very similar methods of argumentation. For example, the the analogy of the potter and the pot, right? Just as if you find a, if you encounter a pot that implies a potter, someone who made that pot, therefore the world as a creation implies a creator. So Buddhists had been kind of, had been dealing with kind of philosophical antagonists who were, present, who were presenting very similar arguments. And I would imagine that the Buddhist monks that Desideri was interacting with, perhaps if he had gotten to the level of kind of seriously presenting his argument with them and debating with them, they would have had, you know, ready counter arguments that they could have, you know. Most likely, but as yeah. you say, honestly, even in the Relazione, he hardly ever really talks about that. You know, so he does say that he spent these extensive periods of time in these different locations and he distorts a lot of the names. So sometimes it's not actually very easy to find out what he's referring to. Sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot. We do know that he also spent some time with some Nyingma uh, masters, but uh, so he learned about some, some uh, Tzotchen also at some point, uh, which is, you know, a tradition from the Nyingma school. But uh, we don't really know very much what, the response was honestly, uh, because it's not that, for instance, we have any correspondence that he and um, you know he, he undertook with any of the Tibetan locals. You know, so we don't we don't really see that very much. So we don't really know. Yeah, you know. I mean, of course, you know, you have you. I don't know how much maybe the audience knows, but you know, uh, there was always a, an Islamic presence in uh, in in Tibet in the largest cities. You know, in Plaza and in and in Shigatse. Uh, you know, so there was. Uh, you know, a kind of theistic tradition at your doorstep. Uh, but um, it's actually quite likely that uh, in many ways, those arguments against the first cause or against Ishvara, et cetera, had largely become purely theoretical for most Tibetans by that time, because they were not really debating any Hindus anymore because they weren't, you know, but, but you're right. I mean, you read the, you know, even Shantideva, you know, in the last chapter of meditation, he says that, you, you know, if you believe in Ishvara or your practice is pointless. Uh, uh, so that, that's actually quite common. It's interesting because what Desideri finds very surprising is that essentially he encounters 
a situation where atheism is a religious position, yeah. which is very surprising for him. And I think even today for many people who are kind of educated in a broader Western culture, that still remains a sort of jarring notion. Because I think in most Western culture operate according to this idea that uh, there is a kind of uh, contrast between being a religious person versus being an atheist. And if you are an atheist, you are not a religious person. But clearly, that's a false dichotomy because, uh, you know, if you read the Majamaka tradition, it's quite clear that this is a non-theistic tradition that is a religious tradition. And, and uh, essentially, the affirmation of atheism is the basis of your own religious growth. Yeah. That completely debunks everything that Desideri was thinking, you know, coming from like the scholastic perspective that I was discussing before. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you, you point to some interesting questions there. I mean, on the one hand, you know, Buddhists traditionally reject the idea of the creator God, you know, Ishvara in the kind of Indian philosophical discourse. But you mentioned in your paper, although you didn't really get into this, you know, in your presentation, that there are some interesting kind of facets of Buddhist thought that can be interpreted in a theistic manner. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, Tsongkhapa's interpretation of the four Buddha bodies you mentioned, you know, Dolpopo's idea of, of other emptiness, you know, kind of, you know, kind of reifying emptiness as a kind of substantial ultimate reality. And so there are perhaps hooks that a theist, theist can point to as saying, okay, even in your own tradition, you have these ideas that point toward the quote unquote truth of, of God. Right? 100%. And you know, I don't know, it's my colleague Peter Feldmeyer from the University of Toledo has published a book recently on theistic elements in Mahayana, which I have not yet read, but he's actually, I talked about that with him. And you know, it's exactly really about that, you know, especially in the four body version of uh, the um, Kaya theory that uh, the Gelug tradition espouses. You know, there is a tendency to split the highest body into two and the higher part of the sort of the Dharmakaya becomes epistemologically exclusive to the Buddha in a way that uh, resembles almost uh, the assertion that there is a sort of divine reality which is distinct. Uh, so yes, it seems that there, there are tendencies there, you know, where on one hand you deny the existence of Ishvara or the creator God, on the other hand, your Buddhology becomes so high to borrow a kind of Christian set of terms, that then the Buddha becomes the ground of being. Yeah. Especially according to Dolpopa, who talks about, uh, you know, the Buddha nature being ather empty or zheng tong, because then it becomes ontologically full of, of what? Of itself. And then it really becomes the ground of being, like the Atman of the Hindus, you know, which is why that tradition was always sidelined even by Tibetans themselves who found it problematic, you know, like the Jonankas, etc. So here we see one possible kind of approach to kind of Buddhist Christian dialogue, right, with each tradition kind of looking for elements of their own tradition in the other and kind of highlighting that in their argumentation. And I guess my next question for you is, do you see that as a good approach to Buddhist Christian dialogue or would you recommend, you know, a different way of approaching this? Because the danger, it seems to me, is that you could have the two parties kind of talking in a way not at each other but over each other and kind of you know missing you know making an argument that the other person just simply refuses to accept ah, if i had a good answer to your question i think we would be much further ahead in dialogue where we are i think uh, you know the the real challenge is really to just meet I mean, maybe this is an incredible platitude, but I would just say it anyway. You know, the real challenge is to really be able to meet the other where the other is. And it sounds very easy, but it's so extremely difficult to actually do that uh, because we always fall into the temptation of so interpreting the position of the other from our own particular hermeneutic. And we have to learn how to strip this away and kind of sort of see the position of the other from the other's perspective. And unless we are really able to do that, I think it's very difficult to actually move on, uh, you know, in the, in the context of conversation. And I'm not sure that even this theory was always able to do that, you see, because he was still coming from this kind of perspective where he was kind of trying to frame the position of the artist within his own broader theological framework. 
Uh, and this is why I said, you know, that sometimes his method is inspiring, but perhaps we shouldn't always follow it. <laughs> well, let me let me go to one of the questions by a member of our audience. Uh, David Dawson uh, asked a question. Do we know why the Franciscans were favored over the Jesuits by the Vatican when interacting with Tibet? Uh, you know, the answer is not particularly profound, largely because they were there before, you know, and they were the first to reach uh, Laza and established a, a settlement there. So, you know, the fact that they were not actually really doing missionary work didn't seem to matter very much. Uh, so uh, that really he sort of ended the conversation, you know. In fact, you know, Desideri went back to Europe later on, although he spent some time in India after leaving Tibet, because he really wanted to appeal uh, this case to propaganda freedom, but then he lost the case, uh, which is why he was not even to publish his relazione. And then even the Franciscan mission disappeared, although we don't really know exactly uh, why uh, and when, you know, but probably by the mid 18th century, they were also gone. You know, so, um, yeah, there, there isn't really much of it. There isn't, there isn't really a theological argument behind, the, you know, why one order was favored over the other, really. Well, uh, in a in a quick follow up, uh, uh, I mean, I imagine the fact they never learned Tibetan could have played a contributing role. Well, of course, yes, yeah. no, 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 of course, of course, of course. And you know, they were, you know, in fact, by the way, the, the, this area was not the first Jesuit to reach Tibet because there were some Portuguese Jesuits who reached Tibet uh, in the 17th century, and you know, and talked about their travels, but they didn't stay there, they didn't learn the language, and they were not actually, you know, engaged in any kind of dialogue. You know, but sometimes you find writing say that this area was the first Jesuit to reach Tibet. That's actually not true, uh, but he was the first one who actually stayed and actually engaged in the conversation with the local culture. I mean, it seems that Oderico da Pordenone, who was a Franciscan bishop in the 13th century, was the first Christ, uh, Italian missionary to reach Tibet in like 1260. It seems he visited Laza, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, he didn't stay there for any length of time. You know, he was on his way back from China to Italy. You know, um, well, anyway, I should end here. So, so the, the, the refusal of the Vatican to allow Desideri to return to Tibet or publish his, his works, that, that was in no way connected with the much more famous rights controversy later, which led to the temporary abolishment of the Jesuit order, right? I really don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I don't think the two things are in any way connected. And you know, Desideri never went to China and... Um, See, you know, this area was in, uh, you know, in Tibet during this really complicated time when, you know, there was a Zugar invasion and then the Chinese sent uh, a kind of army installed, like some, you know, military, this, the Chinese decided to establish a military presence in, in Tibet, which actually stayed there until 1911, you know, but uh, he was not really probably even familiar with a lot of those conversations you know, of any kind. You know, and uh, we don't even know very much about, you know, let's say, you know, what, uh, you know, since you asked about ritual, etc. you know, like, how did this dairy, you know, actually celebrate mass or, you know, like, was, you know, did he allow Tibetans to attend the little Jackson? He never writes about that. So there, there are a lot of things we don't, we don't really don't know, uh, because he, he never really talks about himself all that much. Really, he's writing a lot about the country that he encounters and their culture and all sorts of other things. But there are a lot of things that we don't know. Even his correspondence, as I said, you know, is not really there. Now, uh, David Dawson has a follow-up question. Uh, maybe you, there's no way you could know this, but did any of the early Christians in Tibet take up any of the Buddhist or yogic practices? See, I, I don't think I can answer this question. We don't really know. I, I have no idea. I don't think I can answer this question. Yeah, you know, I, so. I, I assumed probably not, but. Yeah, no one knows, you see. We know a lot more about China, I mean, you know, but uh, because we know a lot about, you know, the first Chinese Catholics, we have a lot more information, but we don't really know anything about, about this, you know. Uh, yeah, sorry, I cannot give you a much more intelligent response than that, you know. Is, uh, is there any is there any evidence, uh, Thomas, that either Desideri or the Franciscans who were there before him succeeded in converting any Tibetans to Catholicism? Well, it seems he did convert some people, but that didn't seem to go very far. Uh, so, 
yeah, he, they seem to have converted a few people, but you know, where you know, this seems to all have disappeared. By the way, I mean, there may actually, you know, one curious thing is that, uh, which is nobody really knows why, is that some people claim that there were Armenian Christians living in Laza at the time. Uh, and uh, because, you know, there are Armenians everywhere in Asia and they, they had trading posts. Uh, and uh, apparently there were Armenian Christians in, in Laza already in the 16th century at the time of the fifth Dalai Lama. Sorry, 17th century, so earlier. Uh, and they were probably there, but uh, which means that there must have been other Christians there already. But again, this really never mentions them and never says anything about them. So like, was he there for four years and never heard that there were other Christians? Nobody told him, why doesn't he mention them? So that's all. But again, there are a lot of things that we don't really know, you know, and nor does he talk about the, the Muslims in, in, uh, in Laza. He talks about Muslims in, uh, in, uh, in Ladakh. Uh, he talks about how Tibetans are very unfriendly towards Muslims, interestingly enough, you know, but uh, he doesn't, seem to undertake, uh, you know, enter into any relationship with the locals, you know. Well, as, as you may know, Thomas, there was a kind of distinct quarter of Lhasa where the Muslims lived, and they, they, for example, engaged in, you know, practices such as the animal trade and, you know. Oh, yes. Uh, but, he, but, but maybe he wasn't, he never visited that part of town and wasn't familiar with that. Uh, it is possible, you know, even today, you know, if you visit Laza, you will see that uh, uh, the Muslims that live there are involved in, uh, you know, the production and sale of caterpillar tea, which is very popular with uh, Chinese tourists. You may have seen that yourself. And also in Shigatse, which is the second largest city in, um, in Tibet, very close to the Tashilumpo Monastery, which is the seat of the Panchen Lam. There is a huge mosque, etc. And in fact, the population of Muslims in Tibet is actually increasing now because of intermarriage with Uyghurs, etc. You know, uh, but it's always been a small minority. They used to have jobs like, you know, being butchers. You know, they can do things that are kind of karmically not advisable, you know, like killing animals and uh, uh, doing unpleasant things like that, you know, but uh, they were all, they always remain a minority. And that was why they were viewed uh, with poorly by Tibetans such as the Ladakhis who, you know, would eat the meat, but, you know, perhaps hypocritically condemned the people who, who butchered the animals for them. But, uh, but Tibetans have always eaten meat, you know, as so I, I told students of mine many times, and I actually, I went to Tibet with a group of American Buddhists, many of whom were strict vegans, and you, know, you arrive in Tibet and you certainly don't find vegan food, especially in traditional Tibet where you couldn't grow anything, you know, so then, you know, the, the, the monastic codes from Sri Lanka, presupposed a very different kind of climate yeah. uh, where you could actually live like that in Tibet, you couldn't. You know? yeah. I think someone, I, th I, I think I see an interesting question from uh, Sharita Tamara Moraga. Uh, hello, Sharita, I haven't seen you for a long time, uh, although I don't see you here. Uh, my own uh, perspective on creation. See, I struggle with, I don't struggle with the question, but I struggle with this idea and you are, it's a very interesting point. Uh, because um, in a way, um, I find the notion of uh, codependent origination and ongoing causality something very appealing, something that resonates with me uh, very strongly. And yet at the same time, as someone who is a cradle Christian, uh, I find it uh, impossible to stop, let go of the notion of the creator God, you see, obviously for obvious reasons. So perhaps, you know, I am sort of trying to find the synthesis within myself and I'm not sure that I've actually really been able to do that you know, in, in, a, in a very good way. Um, I, yeah, I guess that's all I can say really at this point, you know. I see that someone is asking about whether there is a, this kind of debate. Yeah, yeah, camera. Oh, yes, you know, the debates, uh, you know, the debates, as I said, you know, the Majamaka debates continue, even now they are really a part of the training of, uh, you know, of Gelug monks, you know. Gelug monks have a very long training, you know, period. You know, if you get the Geshe degree, it takes more than 20 years. It's worse than the Jesuits, you see. So, uh, worse or longer than the Jesuits, let's say. Uh, it takes a really long time, you know. Um, so this kind of training continues to take place. 
Thank you, Tony, for being there. I'm reading in the meantime what the chat says. Uh, but, and certainly, you know, the kind, maybe Buddhist Christian dialogue as such doesn't take the form of a formalized debate. That is not the case. But certainly this conversation, I, I don't, um, I see a question from Cameron here, here, who is asking whether there have been more recent examples of dialogue and debate. There are a lot of instances of such conversations at different academic conferences, both in the United States and in Europe. Maybe they don't take the form of debates in this way, but uh, uh, yes, certainly that's, that's certainly the case. And we might point to, you know, the attempts by certain Tibetan lamas like the Dalai Lama to engage in dialogue with Christians and not so much in a kind of traditional debate style, but in a more kind of, I guess, informal dialogue style. There is a very good book from the 90s called The, the Good Heart. See, I, I think it's called yeah, The Good Heart. The good yes, Heart. The Good Heart, which has this very cheesy cover, but it's actually a very good book, uh, which is a, a collection of reflections by the Dalai Lama on different passages of the New Testament. Uh, developed from a series of talks that he gave in the 90s in London at a conference, you know, uh, on, uh, you know, on Christian Buddhist monastic dialogue. Very interesting because, you know, he comes up with ideas that you would never imagine, you know, like, you know, he encounters these passages for the first time in his life, all the transfiguration, oh, really, what is this? You know, maybe this is like the Buddha bodies, etc. So he says all sorts of interesting things for Christian readers, especially, you know, because he brings a very different perspective. Yeah. It looks like we are running out of time, aren't we? Uh, do we? Do we still have time, Aaron, or are we out of time? Um, it, maybe one more question if that works for Thomas to, to wrap up or, or um, we kind of 715 was kind of a possible endpoint. So, um, but if you have one more question, David, I think it might, we can end on that. Well, well let me ask one, one more question, which is kind of a follow up question to one of the previous audience questions. You had mentioned before the Armenian, you know, Christians in Tibet and I remember when I was an undergraduate studying in Kathmandu, Nepal, I met a Tibetan man who was a Christian who, who when he learned that I was an American studying Buddhism, kind of got a little angry with me, or at least was a little bit confrontational for me, kind of leaving my native Christian tradition as he saw it. And then I, I turned the argument back at him, well, aren't you accusing me of the same thing you're doing, you know, converting from Buddhism to Christianity? He's like, oh no, my family has been, Christian for centuries. Well, and uh, you have things, examples like that. Yes. Yeah. And he was from Lhasa. I, I didn't, at the time, I didn't know enough to kind of question him about what version of Christianity he practiced or where he lived in Lhasa. But, you know, clearly there have been Christian elements in Tibet going way back even to the imperial period, you know, you know, seventh through 10th century. I think both. Uh, both uh, Christopher Beckwith and Matthew Capstein have written about the early Eastern Nestorian Christian presence in Tibet, Central Asia, and the influence that had on early Tibetan kind of the formation of early Tibetan Buddhism. So clearly there's there's a long history. Oh, yes, and Christian I mean, dialogue. you know, there is a book by Francis Tiso uh, came out a couple of years ago uh, on uh, the body of light, uh, which yes, yes. is the uh, specific practice that is done by certain lamas towards the end of their life. And he kind of discovers very interesting points of contact between uh, uh, this tradition and analogous tradition in, uh, you know, the sort of Christian East in the fourth and the fifth century. And sometimes there are even textual correspondences that are amazing. So you wonder in what way, you know, there were, you know, sort of contacts between these traditions that we don't really know. So there is, there can be all sorts of subterranean things that we are not really aware of, you know, but uh, it's very difficult to kind of unearth this genealogy and bring it out into the open. Well, clearly this is a fertile area for continued research and I'm, I'm very thankful for you for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Yeah, I'd like to yes. I want to thank Thomas and David for being here <clears throat> and taking part um, and a wonderful conversation and a wonderful talk from Thomas. And um, I think these themes will continue through the next two events in April, as I said. And so information about those two events will be coming out soon. Um, but thank you all for being here. Thank you again to Thomas and David. And I hope everyone has a great, a great evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, sir.